How about I just give a take home? No. I don't know. <laughs> I think there are a sufficient number of vote no's for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> take home that bad? You don't want take home like math. Uh, They're not. Bad. I've got one take home now. That's a bad. <laughs> it's a research project. Go home. Yeah, go well, on the okay, internet. We'll give you a research, research project to do. Huh? We'll give you a research project. No, 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 well, no. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of the final. Well, no, I'll do the final because that's on stats. And that should be pretty easy. <laughs> okay. yeah. I don't understand the stuff. Okay, what well, don't you understand like, about this test? Like how to get the variance. Like the variance, like if you have okay. two random variables, you do some, like if you have two variants, so a random variable like x and y, and then you multiply yeah, those problem. together. Yeah, and then how do you find the variance? Like, uh, Okay, let's do a problem like that. From the variance operator. Sure, let's do that. Let's do a problem. How about problem 4.54, 4.55, 4.56? These are the ones that I'm thinking of making the substitution for one of those problems. Right? This is what you're asking about. Actually, the first two parts, variance of u and variance of v, those are going to have the same answers, right? No. Well, these first two things, the variance of u and the variance of v, why not? Because, well, because I've assumed that each of these has the same variance. Oh, so if right. I can answer no, you, I can answer you. Do you want it different? Yeah. Okay. With respect to variances, sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared, sigma 3 squared. Then. Sigma x squared, yeah. Okay, so I'll just leave it as in the book. You want that with respect to variances? Sigma x squared, sigma y squared, sigma z squared. You want some full blown tests. Okay. Then the answers are different. Alright, so that's how do you do the variance of u? Variance of u, but still, because I know the answer to A, I'll go to the answer. All right, the variance of u, because it's the same problem, I have independent variables and the two variances are given. I'm adding them by the formula for the variance of the sum. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's straightforward. It's, uh, what do you call it? Variance of z plus x, right? So how do you do the variance of the sum? Just add them to the variances together. And under what condition? Independent. Or more generally, no covariance is no, yeah, covariance is zero. Okay. So in general, I have variance of z plus the variance of x plus twice the covariance between x and z. Well, how did you get okay. the covariance part? Well, how do I get this formula? Yeah. Okay. 
that goes back to fill in this blank. I can only write the variance as the covariance of the object with itself. Then I use properties of covariance. Properties of covariance is that it's linear on both sides of the comma. And that's what I mean. <laughs> okay. And then and the fact that covariance is z with z. So this is covariance z with z plus covariance x with z plus covariance z with x plus covariance x with x. That's using the linearity. You also use the symmetry, covariance x z is the same as covariance z x. And you, use the, and you go back to the fact that, reading backwards, that the covariance of z with itself is the variance of z. <laughs> This is the variance. So this is by linearity property of the covariance on both sides of the comma. Then I have this is the variance. This is the covariance, and it's because x and z are real variables. That's a symmetric business. We can use the variance again. So there is the formula. That's the general formula. So if the variables are un Covariated, the variance of the sum is the sum of variances. Like I said, it was, it's like an inner product. If I wanted the, the square length of the sum of two vectors, well, my question is, how would I do that? If I had a square length of the sum of two vectors, how, would, how do I do that? And, and, uh, when you're on the sum of vectors, yeah. Can't. Oh, the. I mean, if, I, if, I just, if I wasn't given the vectors explicitly, and I, so I couldn't add, then I could find okay, the you square are the plus Euclidean length. If I was given some other things like the angle between the vectors and things like that. Okay. The length of the two vectors and the angle between them. How would I do that? So given, given u equals to 1, b equals to 2, and the angle between them is uh, 45 degrees. Uh -huh. Okay? What are we trying to find? Just add them. It's this. I want to find the square length of the sum of the two vectors given that I, I give you the polar representation of the two things, which is 45 degrees. Okay? What's the square length of the sum? I have to add these right geometrically. It's a problem, right? I just so put this uh -huh. one to the end of that one, and I have yeah. to construct this triangle. Uh -huh. I want to find that side of the triangle. Uh -huh. Square length of that side of the triangle. Uh -huh. Some kind of law of cosines or whatever. All right? No, I can't do that. Yeah, but if I remember the law of cosines formula, what do I do? Okay? Uh -huh. So what I do is I write this out as the inner product of u plus v with u plus v and start expanding the thing. That's what the square length is. <laughs> okay. Oh. Yeah. So it's the same exact technique. The inner product of u with u is the square length of u. So this comes out to be u squared plus v squared plus twice the inner product of u with v. Now how do I get the inner product of u with v? Well, that's twice, that's the uh, product, that's the inner product of u and v. This is the encapsulation of the law of cosines, is the cosine of the angle times the product of the two lengths. Yeah. Okay? Remember that's good stuff? Yeah. Okay? That's the same thing as saying that the, that the corresponds exactly to the fact that the covariance between two variables x and y is equal to rho xy sigma x, sigma y. Okay? Uh, it's exactly the same. This is the cosine of the angle, rho, number between minus 1 and 1. Uh, so you can use it. So it's exactly the same technique. That's my point. Okay? Okay. So when you're saying they're independent, basically rho's zero, that means it's like a perpendicular. Okay, if they're in, yeah, yeah, it turns out that uh, it's not an if and only if, but if independent, they're perpendicular. And if perpendicular and jointly normal, then independent. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's. We didn't talk about the jointly normal. Okay, jointly normal, two two vectors, jointly normal. Okay, if they have a bivariate normal distribution. Okay, which is somewhere in the text. Okay. And then the condition rho equals to zero. Only normal can be talked about more generally, they just apply very, very much.
variance. I have a question. What if it's like you ask like variance of z times x? How do you find that? Okay. And well, that's the next problem. Five fifty six. Four fifty six. Excellent. Okay. So this one you can finish off, and let's just go ahead and do the computations here again. It's, so it's just it's just Euclidean um, arithmetic basically here. So this is this comes out to be therefore sigma z squared plus sigma x squared plus zero because we assume the independence and so on. Variance of v therefore by a similar technique is sigma z squared plus sigma y squared. Okay, what about the covariance between u and v? Covariance between u and v. Now I have to plug in. You use the linearity of the covariance again. This is a covariance z plus x, z plus y. Then I have to expand it. So this time I'm forced to expand it. So this is a covariance of z with z plus covariance x with z. Then we have four terms, right? Plus covariance of uh, that with this with this and this with this. I know z with y and x with y plus covariance z y plus covariance x y. These last two are zero. Actually, all three of these last ones are zero. All right? By independence. So this comes out to be variance of z plus zero plus zero plus zero. Okay. Okay. So u and v are have a not have are positively correlated to non-negative covariance. You can see. All the plus signs involved in the definitions of u and v. Okay? Now you have that uh, the row of u and v is defined to be the covariance between u and v divided by the square root of the variance of u and the square root of the variance of v. Wolf's, well, I just put down the variance of z divided by the square root of sigma z squared plus sigma x squared, and the other one is the square root of sigma z squared plus sigma y squared. So then that's just plug it in. Okay, obviously that's less than one. Oh, that's not that good. Okay. Actually, it's 457 that they wanted to find the variance of the product. This is a special problem. So you can't always find the variance of anything you want that easily, it turns out. But we, we surely want to be able to do it when we can do it. So you wanted to look at the variance of a product. Let's look at 457. I think this pretty much covers this business. 457, there should have that little list. It's a sequence of problems all the put on no variance. Uh, 457 says, suppose x and y are independent. And now you need to know the means and variances, let's say, of 8. Uh, so let x and y be independent with uh, respect to means and variances. This time I can't use the co I mean the covariance operation is not going to help me a whole lot other than maybe just going back to the definition. So do you see a way out of it? No. Oh, expect a value. Yeah, of just the definition. What's the definition? Well, the expected value of x, y. That was going to be there. I'm going to square that. And I'm going to take the expected value of x squared, y squared here. That's the definition of the variance. 
by a shortcut method. So-called shortcut because there are a couple of different versions, right? So you subtract the mean from the quantity and then you square it and then take the expectation of that. That's another version. But this is obviously the way to go here in this problem. Now what can you use? What about the independence value you're going to be able to use? Well, expected value of x squared, of, well, the first term equals expected value of x squared plus x, I mean, times expected value of y squared. That is correct. Because by the independence. independence. Yeah, by the independence. What if it's not one? independent? Then I have to bring in the integrals? <laughs> then I have to start worrying about uh, covariance? Covariances and stuff. How do you, if there are we'll no be able to do it here. Huh? We'll be able to do it here. Of more assumptions. I have no assumptions. I can't do it. What do you mean assumption? Like I need to know something about the joint distribution of x and y. Like if it's like if if I can't find this without some assumption about the joint distribution of x and y. What if they give you the more than the covariance? More than a covariance? Yeah, there's more than the covariance of this problem. Here, I, the independence is a very strong condition about the joint distribution. I know f, the joint is density is f of x, y equals the marginal density of x times the marginal density of y. I already have enough information about the marginal density of x and the marginal density of y to fix the problem. I'm only looking for variance, it turns out. So just give me that what the covariance is, that, that amount of information about the joint distribution would not be enough for this problem. If I said they were jointly normal, by very normal, and I gave you the covariance, then I could finish it. How do you finish this problem? Just, just break it apart. Yo, you just said you just said e x squared times e y squared minus e x e y. Again, I can split this part by the independence of x and y. That part is squared. Now I can write everything down in terms of those parameters. How? How would I calculate e x squared in terms of those parameters? That's by independence. Expectation of a product is a product of expectations when they're independent. How do you face No. Well, how would I get EX squared in terms of sigma 1 squared and mu 1? This is all it has to do with the density of X. Oh. This all has to do only with distribution of X. This has only to do with that's just the variance minus mu one squared or whatever. Yeah, you can rewrite it. Just this plug way. it in. E of x squared, right, equals mu one squared plus sigma one squared. Okay. You just rewrite. You re write the formula for variance backwards, or in this form. Uh, so, so you basically just. So in other words, put the minus sign, sign here, and you get variance. So just put the thing on the other side. So you just plug and check the rest. That's right. Then you can decide whether you want a covariance problem on the exam or not. Um, I think I'll just skip the moment generating stuff for the final exam. Because we're going to have chapter 6 has more moment generating function techniques. Okay. And also, chapter 7 is going to have the covariance thing back in it. So I could also save that for the final exam. Okay. So you don't have to have it here. You don't want to. Depends on I just decided I was going to focus a little bit more some of the other stuff for this exam. Are we going to have chapter 5 on the exam? Yes. Okay. There's a such a limit problem. There is one of those. Great. Uh, and we're going to have the table, right? Yeah. I'm going to give you the table from, or you can always bring a book if you really want to read it out of your book. But I will bring the table. And if I don't, then I'll run down the hall and get, no, I have to bring a table. Easy. I think this I this approach in chapter five is a little bit more conceptual and it gets that convergence of distribution stuff. I thought that was interesting. Um, 
and I can give, show you a little bit more as well than I would show it for you on one of those central limit problems. So let's, uh, are there any comments about any of the problems? Any ones that you want to go into particularly? Just go over Just go over quickly and I can just run through it. And Problem one has to do, this is the We have f of x is alpha x minus alpha minus 1, x squared is equal to 1. This was actually kind of a really easy problem. It just has to do with, do you understand what an expectation is? Yeah, expectation of x is integral x, f of x dx, 1 to infinity, and that simply is alpha x x to the minus alpha minus 1 dx from 1 to infinity, which is alpha times the integral 1 to infinity x to the minus alpha dx. I have to raise the exponent by 1 and divide by the new exponent alpha x to the minus alpha plus 1 divided by minus alpha plus 1, go from 1 to infinity, and I have to uh, do this only in case alpha is big enough so that the integral converges, alpha is bigger than 2, Assume so that's not a problem here. This converge, this integral converges. Good. I'll get a minus sign coming in when I subtract get infinity. This expression goes to zero. Assuming alpha was big enough to begin with. And then I get a minus sign from the calculation of the differences in the fundamental theorem of calculus. And so I'll get an alpha zero minus. Assuming alpha is bigger than 2, so you don't get messed up on the first two parts of the problem. Now I need the variance, so I need the second moment. So the calculation is the same, <laughs> okay, pretty much. Uh, you get a different exponent to integrate. So it's now integral of x to the minus alpha plus 1 from 1 to infinity. Now alpha is bigger than 2. Do the integral, but <coughs> assume that it is. So we get alpha x to the minus alpha plus 2 over minus alpha plus 2, 1 to infinity. Alpha times 0 minus 1 over minus alpha plus 2 equals alpha over alpha minus 2, alpha bigger than 2. Okay? And then the rest of the problem should be an easy case. So you've done that. Okay. So the second moment exists, and therefore the variance is uh, alpha over alpha minus 2 minus alpha over alpha minus 1 quantity squared. And I'm not going to bother to simplify that. Okay? I'm not going to take my precious time on the exam to simplify that. That's an answer. Oh, you're cool with that answer? Yes. Ah, nice. Okay. I mean, if what I if say I simplify it, it yeah. makes it possible. If we don't evaluate the integrals. <laughs> yeah, if we don't evaluate the integrals. Well, I'll catch you on the third part of the problem. Okay, oh. at least. Probably a little bit. Yeah, you could not evaluate the integrals, too. You can just put it all down. That would probably I'll take one point for that. But, uh, what's that? You have any question? No. What if I just leave it like alpha over negative alpha over negative alpha plus 2. Well, as long as you understand what it's doing, you can get to the last part of the problem. Oh. No. Okay. You know, because the last part of the problem is to take e of x to the k. And that's going to give alpha uh, negative minus alpha plus k. So now, can you deal with that? That's alpha over alpha minus k. That's a little bit nicer way to write it. Okay. Uh, and that's for alpha bigger than k, obviously. So that's the condition I'm looking for right there. Alpha has to be bigger than, than k. 
So I want the third moment, alpha has to be bigger than three. Yeah. I want the fourth moment, alpha has to be bigger than four. How did you get four? That. Alpha plus k. Oh. Each time you integrate, it's you get an extra. Obviously, you've got to get a non negative value. Okay, you've got to get a non negative value for the mean. It's x is bigger than 1. Okay? So, obviously, this formula doesn't make sense once alpha is bigger than k. So, even without doing anything else, just getting the answer will give me the answer. Some things are natural. <laughs> okay. All right. So that was very reasonably natural. Okay. I could go back through and explain what alpha has to be bigger than k because you get alpha x to the minus alpha plus k minus one here. All right. So this becomes a k minus one and the expectation of x to the k. Does the integration of um, the density does that have to be positive all the time? Does the what? Um, does the probability density have to be positive? So is that why alpha needs to be greater than k? Or this no, here it needs to be greater than k. Because if I get minus alpha plus k minus 1, right, the minus 1 is good. But that's just enough. I mean, that's just barely enough. I need another negative contribution to the x one. Oh, okay. Okay, so I need minus alpha plus k to be le to be less than zero. I want to do this carefully, which means alpha bigger than k. I put the alpha on the other side. The integral diverges. Yeah, the, otherwise the integral diverges. Yeah. If alpha is less than or equal to k, the integral diverges. Converges. Convergence. If and only if minus alpha. Okay, less than zero. And the expectation only exists if it converges. Yeah, the expectation of x to the k exists if only if this converges. It's, we already assumed that alpha is bigger than 2, so this one was okay. I used to assume you can do the integrals in this first part, and then say, okay, take the handle part about the convergence in the second part. And tell me what moments exist. So, it was getting to the idea of moments. It's a, not, it's a decent problem. It's a little bit algebraic, you know, for a test. Yeah. Very algebraic. Right. Well, I don't show more. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you just have to be good with algebra. That's the problem. Say what? You have to be a little bit good with algebra this conversion. So it's a good count two problem. <laughs> Let's go on. The stick has unit leg. They decided to reprise the stick problem because you'd all, many people had seen it. We um, did it in class. Stick has unit length. We break the stick at x according to the probability density. Now, well, not a uniform breakage, but according to the probability density. So we're only going to break it in the middle, kind of, because the, dense, the breakage density is going to be f of x equals 6x, 1 minus x. So that means that we're not going to break it at the ends, near the ends, very much. Okay. This is area under the one under the curve. Okay. And so break the unit stick at x in zero one according to the density to the probability function. If you want to call that. Somebody likes to call it probability function. A lot of people do f of x. Okay? <laughs> All right. Um, the unit stick, unit length stick, mm -hmm. unit length. That means the stick is this. This is the stick. It's on the x-axis, and then we're going to break it. When x equals half the um, f of x equals one. It's three halves. That's right. That's okay. The density. Density member just has units of probability, has units of uh, probability per unit length. So, so can you say the longer stick is always between 0.5 and 1 or something? Is that what you do for yeah. this problem? Yeah, the longer stick is always between 0.5 and 1. So you just say something like that, and then you multiply your experiment yeah, but, by 2. Yeah, but what about the smaller stick? It's the ratio of the longer to the shorter. Yeah, it's it's the other one is just 1 minus. Your, 
other one. Yeah. So. You probably expect the value of this. Right? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. So it's actually the expected value of a function of a random variable, right? Yeah. So my function is g of x equals x over 1 minus x when x is bigger than a half. Maybe I'll come up with a different function for you to do. Okay. No. <laughs> Don't be too complicated. You don't have to give the function. 1 minus x over x, or x less than a half. Okay? That's my function. And I want the expectation of that function of the random variable. Okay? So I want e of g of capital X. Oh, don't hurt us. <laughs> That's one of the ones you've learned, right? You learned this function. Okay. So what are you going to do? Just integrate, multiply g of x times f of x. Okay. Okay, let's do it then. So that's integral g of x times f of x dx. 0 to 1 equals, because f of, x, one. f of x is concentrated oh. equals 0 to 1. I didn't put that here. 0 to less than x less than 1. That was the problem. Uh, but it does equal to 2 times. Could you use symmetry? Five? Yes, you can use symmetry here. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, because the density is symmetric and the function is symmetric, okay? So, uh, space, so the density really has symmetric. to be symmetric. Because the density is symmetric. Because the density is symmetric. Yeah, the density has to be symmetric. Otherwise, I'll have to do the whole thing. The density is symmetric. I only have to do half of this business. So that's twice integral one half to one, let's say. X over one minus X by symmetry. Symmetry of f of X. x times x times times six x one minus x dx with a two outside. Well, it wouldn't be too hard to do with two pieces if you didn't cross this. Let's do another interval. There it is, and then it's just a matter of put this nice little one minus x cancels so you don't get any singularity this time. And um, that's just a piece of cake. So this comes out to seven and a half. We only got a logarithm or singularity. When we get it with uh, the case of zero x comments. Well, that was expectation of a function. Actually, both first problems were expectation of a function of a random variable. Although the first one was just moments, and this one was a little bit more interesting. So I don't know. They're almost the same problem. So. Three. But x and y have the joint density. So the joint density is f of x, y equals 3x, 0 less than y, less than x, less than 1, or 0 less than x, less than 1. Okay, so there's a region in the plane which is specified for where this density is supported and has value of 3x at the points in that region in the plane. So it might be a good idea to actually draw that region in the plane. So 
from AO joint density. It's nice to usually see what the so-called support looks like. Y is less than X. Y equals X is the boundary. Y less than X is stuff down here. Let's just this easy triangle again. That's the support. Okay. First problem is just tell me the marginal density of X. That's an old problem from exam one and from a course ago. All right. So that just takes a little bit of integration. I can integrate out the Y. So I have to integrate out y. Uh, the joint density, which is 3x. Now, what is the range of integration if I integrate out y for that integrand? 0x. 0x, that's correct. All right. And so I simply get, since the integral, integral is trivial now, there's nothing, no y. 3x squared. Okay. Zero less than x less than one. So that's the marginal density. All right. Compute the conditional mean of y given x. How do I compute the conditional mean of y given x? Joint density over marginal. Yeah, I have to take the mean the y against the conditional density. So I didn't ask you to do the conditional density. No, it's dy. So I have to put in the conditional density. So what is the conditional density? It's the joint density, 3x, divided by the marginal density, 3x squared. Looks kind of funny, right? Because there's no y in the joint density. But that's for uh, y between 0 and x, 0 less than y less than x. Okay, that's what the marginal density is. Okay, that would be dy. Okay? Y here. Okay, so I'm just putting it in the function. So x is fixed. x is a fixed number. So this is the range of this density. Okay, it's simply 1 over x for y between 0 and x. What does that mean? conditional distribution of y to be? Hmm? What's the conditional distribution of y? If the density is 1 over x for y between 0 and x. Oh well, we'll look at that. In other words, you should be able to notice something here. 1 over x, dy, 0 to x, that is what this is going to come out. Right? So what does that remind you? Does that ring any bells or anything? Uniform. Yeah. The density is just, if the density is 1 over A for Y between 0 and A, that means Y is uniform on 0 to A. Well, it's uniform between 0 So Y given X equals X, the corollary of this calculation is uniform 0 to X. Once we actually saw what the marginal, what the conditional density was, I should have gone through the whole thing. Then I could have said, what's the conditional distribution of y? I didn't. Okay, because that would tell you you've got to calculate the conditional density and then observe. So here I didn't do that. You know, I mean, if it doesn't come out easy, it doesn't come out with something to notice, then that's not so interesting, right? But again, you must note that in this problem I did not ask for part B to tell me what the conditional density is. You have to know that that's what you have to calculate. Okay? The value would just be x over 2. That is correct. Very similar to your homework problem, right? Because now it's just uh, the 1 over x is actually a constant in this integration. So that's the integral 0 to x, y dy. So I get 1 over x times x squared over 2, which is x over 2. Which is obvious because if y, is uni y given x, is uniform in 0 to x, and the mean is halfway between 0 and x, which is x over 2. So if you actually notice this, you wouldn't have to do the integration. You just tell me. That's the mean of uniform is halfway between two endpoints. So there are some shortcuts in this problem, if you wish to notice them, or at least checks. Checks and balances, so to speak. You know what I mean? To say, oh, okay, yeah, I can roll. That looks right. Yeah, everything's consistent. This is easy. 
Okay. So the next one will be easier if you know it's a uniform. <laughs> it's just like, like well, you just pray this is going to be the same problem. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> it might not be. Okay. What about the other part? What's the um, variance of y given x equals x? Well, actually, now so if you do know this, what's the conditional variance of y? The variance of the uniform distribution is well, minus twelve. Well, so it's x squared over 12. It's like x minus b minus a squared over. x squared over 12. Okay, I've heard the right answer once. And what is it? x squared over 12. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Because it's uniform. There's nothing to do. Okay. Yeah. Right, so it's x minus, remember it was x minus 0 squared over 12. So if you memorize the fact that the variance of uniform a, b, this is using the memorization is equal to b minus a squared. It is not an open book test, though. I'm, it might as well be, but I'm, it is not open book. Open I decided notes. it won't be open book. Open notes, no. A page of notes? No. Okay. <laughs> You've had this so many times. And we had theory concepts to uh, generate the memory neurons too, whatever they are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, <clears throat> I don't think that you need notes. I mean some people really just don't have great memory structures so they would need notes. But if we don't remember we should just do it always. Just give better memory structures. <laughs> right? That's part of the game. <laughs> Okay, work on it. <laughs> um, okay, so that's the variance. That's conditional variance. If I didn't know how to do it that way, I would say this is the conditional mean of x squared, excuse me, of y squared, given x equal to x, minus conditional mean of y, given x equal to x, quantity squared. All right, that would be how I would do it. That's what the conditional variance is defined as. So if I had to, I would do it this way. I would do integral y squared, or equals y squared times 1 over x dy, 0 to x, minus what I already had was the x over 2, the quantity squared. Okay? So this comes out to be uh, x cubed over 3 times 1 over x, minus x over 2, the quantity squared, equals x squared over 3, minus x squared over 4, which is indeed your x squared over 12. Okay. So that is what a conditional variance is defined as. You find the, again, it's just the variance for the conditional density. Everything is based on the conditional density. You would find, oh, that's a good density. It's a density of y. So I find the square the mean of the square minus the square of the mean for that density, which in notation is that one there. Is everybody kind of following that? It's, it's obviously here. This is okay. This is the mean of the square for that density, 1 over x, y between 2 and x. All right. Now I said show directly that the expectation of this theorem A that the expectation of y is the expectation of the expectation of y given x. Sure. So I really it wasn't very clear what I meant here. Really what I meant was find the expectation of y. And then also find the expectation of the expectation of y given x. Two is ways. That a proof? I want you to show that this, which is one integration falling from part B is the same as this, which is a different integration. I guess, this, how would you find the expectation of Y? Well, we already found expectation of Y of X, so we just find the expectation of X over 2. Yeah, that's this part, that's this way. This is expectation of X over 2. We're saying the density of X, which is 1 half X times 3X squared DX 0 to 1. Which is just... Y 
why? By the theorem. Okay. But if we just show an example. Show directly when I also want you to find me your why by going find the density of y or what have you. Mm -hmm. Or that this is a double interval. Observe an x, observe a y, y times 3x, do y dx. That would be, that's okay. You can always find the expectation of y by using the joint density. So the y would give you the x squared over 2, and you have 3x times x squared over 2, and it would give you exactly the same thing. Uh, would it? Yeah, so it's a half coming in there. Equals x squared over 2 times 3x, 0 to 1. The factors are permuted around, right? But isn't this a theorem, though? Yes, it is a theorem. No, we're proving it so maybe I'm going to change the, the wording of this problem a little bit. Yeah, we're proving the theorem. Just showing it whole Show directly, thing. showing that it actually oh. works. Okay, I want you to do the intervals both ways. Okay? So I don't know how we'll deal with that. So I'm going to have to change a little bit. Let's see. Um, you know, I'll just say, I can give you a problem where you find EY, the only way to do it reasonably is to use the theorem. That's probably what I'll do. You had one like that in the homework. So this problem could come a little tougher. This was an easy version of the problem. Because all the integrals are very trivial. But if I have a problem where like you had an exhibit, like you had your homework. No, these are way too long. I mean, on the test, we don't, we don't have an hour for this stuff. Not like we have, like in EE, we have a two and a half hours to do a six problem. Oh, you do? Two and a half hours? That's great. Where do you get two and a half hours? Oh, because you do it once a week or something? Yeah. Very nice. So this will only have an hour. <laughs> He's happy for you. <laughs> so you should make the integrals shorter or something. Uh, and we have no problem. No, it's even. Only be an Why? Well, well, I'll make lots of room for the pages. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's go on. I don't know. I won't make it too nasty. Okay. I'll make it so it's doable both ways, maybe, but it's certainly easier the other way. How's that? All right. That's a compromise. And you know which way I'm going to make it anyway. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, the next problem with the bottom of the book I thought it would just be fun to look at. I don't know if it's going to be suitable for the exam because I don't know if I can read. Otherwise, I might just have to reproduce it verbatim, which is not that great. Or I can go on to the case x equals three. But what you have is you have a, um, this is a classical um, branching process. Introduction to the branching process. You have an organism, and then it gives some offspring. Maybe it's a cell. You know, but it could be something simple. We're not going to talk about the reproductive process. We're just going to say it gives offspring, non-negative number, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Finite number, obviously. Um, <coughs> in a generation, and so a generation is going to be like a time here. Then the parent is going to die, let's just say, just forget about the parent and forget that. One and done. So they're going to, yeah, one and done, and then you're not, one reproduction um, group, whatever. And then we're only going to follow well, how many there are that have been reproduced? And so the number of the number produced in the case generation is what we're going to be interested in. So the number if there's a single individual, let's write it down the board. X K equals number produced in K generation. Just how many people are around, or how many cells are around in the cave generation, assuming everybody else has died like that. Okay? So it's a decent approximation. Maybe not the greatest. 
you know, both in a factor of two, maybe if a few of them lived on a little bit longer, they didn't produce anymore, there'd be a few more people around, right, or cells. Okay? <laughs> but this would give you pretty much the flavor of what's going on. So we have X1, and let's say one, a one cell initially, all right? So X1 equals number of offsprings of a single individual. You have to get the process started somehow. So you're probably going to say, do not put this problem on the exam. That's fine, but I want to do this problem anyway. Just for the, uh, and I'll find some variant of the ideas in the problem for the exam, perhaps. Perhaps not. We'll just kill it, probably. <laughs> but anyway, I want to do it. So, because it is the branching process, and everybody has to learn that if they learn population genetics or something. So, then we're assuming that the, that the reproduction process always has mean, mu, and variance sigma squared, independent of who is producing what, okay? So let's say, let's say the first individual gives three offspring, okay? Now you have three offspring in generation one. Now what are they going to do? They're going to give offspring, three presumably. More. Okay. Well, they might not give three. They may give one, two, or three, or four, or five, or zero. They have an expected value. Yeah. So, so in other words, if, if the so you can guess reasonably that the expected value of x to the k is mu to the k. Is that what you're saying? Okay, that is correct. Now prove it. <laughs> We're assuming that they're going to reproduce independently. Yeah, so do the math, okay? That's good, good intuition, now do the math, all right? So EX1 equals mu, variance X1 equals sigma squared. We're going to assume now, now you have three individuals, let's pretend that's not mu. Mu is not necessarily three, mu might be one, right? Because uh, you might have zero with some probability, and three with some probability, okay? Is this, is this um, identically distributed? Stuff. Yeah, everybody is going to have the same. Actually, they don't assume identical distribution. They only assume um, equal means and variances. They only that's all that's required here. So actually, they could uh, so they could it, have different distributions as long as they are independent, but they always have the same mean and variance. They can make these calculations. That's a fine point. But we also assume identical distribution. Okay. Is this kind of like the X bar problems that we had earlier, or is it? No, not quite. There's a different technique. Now, how, how am I going to find E of X2? The, the hint was find E X2 given X1 mm -hmm. equals K. Because if I have K individuals now that's, that were offspring by that first person or whatever. And K here is equal to 2? K. K is just whatever it is. Oh, okay. You know, K is not the generation of, oh, I'm sorry. In the X and the nth generation. N generation number, K, the number of offspring of a certain, uh, what's K? K is actually the, K is the number of offspring of the first individual well, that in this situation. Be so that would be the three or the two, you have to fix it in your mind. Is it, oh, let's say they had zero offspring, okay? okay. Well, then obviously dx2 is zero. Okay, but that's only one possibility. They might have had one offspring, two offspring, three offspring, four offspring, and so on. Mm -hmm. Whatever the possibilities were, and I have to consider all those possibilities. For every K, I'm going to find, well, what's the expected of offspring given that, that, that had K offspring initial? Just mu to the K, that's the answer. Well, well wait a second, what's the, this then? So this is, when you have your K individuals now, each producing, okay? So really what X2 is, X2, the distribution of X2 given X1 equals to K is basically, is a sum of, of offspring yeah, numbers. It's a Z1 plus a Z, well you Z as the offspring variable, Z plus Z K. Okay? Right. Independent, each with mean mu and variance mm -hmm. sigma squared. So that's the, this is the key step. This is the key step. The conditional distribution of X2 given X1 equals K is a sum of K independent variables. So then the expectation of x2 given x1 equals k is the sum of the expectations equals k mu. So 
that's the answer here is k mu. Now what's the expectation of x2? Expectation. So that means that this is uh, mu x1. Okay? That's the random variable. So, so that means x2, the, the conditional mean of x2 given x1 is mu x1. That's just a conditional mean. It doesn't mean x2 is mu x1. It means the conditional mean of x2 given x1 is mu x1. But by the theorem, shouldn't that kind of be... Therefore, dx2 equals the mu x1. By the theorem, equals mu this times mu equals mu squared. So there's your theorem. Okay? That's the so that's the number. Of x k would be mu k. Yeah. Mu of x n is mu to the n, what have you. Okay? And we change our generation number to n. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. All right, so that's the number of producing s generation. Oh. So it's like you're getting some things going, and then oh. and then each of these is going to produce something. Okay. Well, this is the intuitive. So so the expected number in the first generation is mu. The expected number mm -hmm. is you're only looking at these numbers. And what's the expected number of individuals here? That's mu squared. Okay. Well, that's in intuitive though because your first generation you have mu and then your second generation if you have the same mu you just mu times mu. Okay, so what about the variances then? What's the variance of x2? Is that the sum of the variances? Is it just 2 sigma squared, 3 sigma squared? What is it? Okay, that's not so intuitive. Okay? What's the variance of x1? Or x2 given x1? Okay. Well that's just the variance of z1 plus dk, right? It's the variance of z1 plus zk equals, well, there are any penance, so that's k times sigma squared. All right? So it's the same idea. So the conditional variance is that. But remember, the variance of x2 is not the expected value of the conditional variance. There's a Steiner's formula. Remember that? The variance of x2. Story I gave about Steiner? I didn't know what Steiner was, but it was a great formula. Okay. Steiner's formula is the variance of x2 is the mean of the conditional variance plus the variance of the conditional mean. Okay? So it's sum of two contributions. So we have the expectation of the variance. That's what you needed to do for this problem. Expectation of the conditional variance is the expectation of x1 sigma squared plus the variance of the conditional mean. The conditional mean was mu x1. Okay. So you have a sigma squared x1 and a mu x1 for the two conditional objects. Then I take the mean and the variance of those two things. So this equals sigma squared times the mean of x1, which is mu, plus variance, which is mu squared, times the variance of x1, which is sigma squared. So I get sigma squared times mu squared plus mu. Oh. What do you think it is if I put in uh, the next generation? Mu to the third? Sigma, sigma to the third? Mu third? No, it'll be sigma squared still. Oh. So it's mu to the third plus mu to the square plus mu to the mu? Yeah, probably. Oh, you didn't do it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just wondered if you're into Yeah, you should get like a geometric series going here in the mu. This is a sigma squared up here. <clears throat> oh, this problem is as complicated as it can get. That's bad? This is kind of bad. That's a good take-home problem, though, isn't it? Say what? Would have been a good take-home problem, except there wasn't enough explained in the book. Perhaps. Okay. As to what X and Z. See, the thing is, the wording on this problem is really bad. But that's the branching problem. See, I couldn't so figure out what K was from the beginning. I thought K was generation. Okay. Yeah, well, that's why we probably won't have it on the exam. But I'll figure out something. Really, what I wanted to cover was the Steiner's formula. Yeah, and also the theorem A, so you have to use theorem A again. So I don't know what I'll do with this. I'll just probably kill it completely, make extra credit or something, change it, make it double extra credit or something. <laughs>
Well, you get it. I'll take that. Okay. <laughs> I can't even understand what to do from the beginning. Okay, let's go on. This, the last two problems are standard, absolutely standard. So, that's maybe almost. So, the volume of a bubble is estimated by measuring its diameter. The volume V of a bubble. So, I might change the problem by a little bit, the bubble, just because I'll put it speaking the words. The volume V of a bubble. That means you gotta know what the formula is, huh? Is estimated by measuring its diameter. And so, according to using using v equals pi over s, this is just some weird formula for a bubble. Okay, it's not the formula for the volume of a sphere or a ball, but it's something else. A bubble. Okay. So there's some kind of strange bubble going on. Suppose that the true diameter is mu. So suppose that E of D equals mu equals 2.0 millimeters. And that the standard deviation of D equals sigma equals 0.1 millimeter. OK. True diameter is mu, and the measurement has mean mu Wording could be perhaps a little bit better. But there it is. Is that clear? That, that the diameter is what was measured. It has mean mu equals 2, and standard deviation sigma equals 0.1. I introduced the mu as the sigma, because that's what we always did in the book. What is the approximate standard deviation of the estimated volume? Then this is the approximate mean invariance because it's one variable. Okay? So the standard deviation uh, sigma sub v is approximately, let's say the variance of v was approximately the variance of d times uh, whatever the function was, g prime of, of mu squared, or something like that. That's how it went. Okay? Where g of d is pi over 60. Okay. Where did you get that? That's out of your memory banks. Oh, my memory banks. Yeah. Maybe at this point, this problem might be suitable to have the text involved. But I'm like, not going to. Huh? <laughs> the approximation stuff? Yeah. No, so oh. You oh. have to memorize that, too. Oh, yeah. ah. In I'm one variable, at least. That would be really well, nasty if I give you the two variable one. That would be nasty, so I'm only asking the one variable. Question. Yeah. Like, you can't do it just by doing explicitly to find the standard deviation? No. Because I don't have the, the density of D. Give it. Do we really? No. Because I'd have to find E of D to the sixth. That I can't find. Do what? I can't find expectation of d to the sixth. Right? I have to find the variance of v, I have to find the expectation of v squared. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. I have to find the expectation of v. I can't do any of that without you exactly. You can find the expectation of v. I can. You, I can find the approximate one. Okay. Why can't you find it? Isn't it just function? Because in the. No, I can't find the expectation of d cubed. Not exactly. But then it's 2 to the third times 5. No, it's, it's not just mu to the third. Oh. That's maybe an approximation. That's a get first guess, but it's not the exact. Uh, so I'm making guesses here. Uh, f of d or something, the well, yeah. density function. Yeah, I need the density to do it exactly. I can't do it exactly. So the whole point is you wanted to do it, go ahead. You want to go back to square root 0? Okay. Then start figure out how you would do it. You'd do the Taylor series and all that stuff. So this is kind of like doing the Taylor, or estimation using Taylor series? Yeah, yeah. And the first term... So I'm going to write this as 5 or 6 u cubed plus uh, pizza. 
Okay, pi over 2, that's the answer. Times uh, mu squared times um, d minus mu. Okay. Plus blah, blah, blah. Okay. I'm going to expand around mu, not around 0. If it was around 0, this is the Taylor expansion already. That's the Taylor expansion right there. If I'm expanding around 0, but I'm not expanding around 0, I'm expanding around mu equals 2. Okay. So I do like this. Okay. For the approximate mean, if I, if I stop here, then the mean of this is zero, so my approximate mean is this. However, if I add another term, which is to take the second derivative, which is 3 times 2, so that's pi times d, right? Um, d with a 1 half, 1 over 2 factorial from the Taylor series formula, d and pi times mu, d minus mu squared. Okay? Plus dot dot dot. So if the approximate uh, formula for uh, the expected value of v is pi over 6 mu cubed plus 0 plus this, the expected value of this term. The expected value of this term is the variance of d, because the expected value of d minus mu squared is the variance of d. E of this is sigma squared sub d. Okay? That's the definition. Okay? So if you were to give us this on the test, would you want us to expand it to the um, second order? Or well, for the expectation. For the expectation. That's what I'm asking part B. Okay. See, I'm saying, assuming that we go ahead and take into account the variability of D, what is the um, approximate value? We're taking into account the variability of d. All right, so that's giving you into doing this expansion, taking the expectation. But how far do we go? Only to the second order ever. Okay, in this method, and you, to calculate the variance of v, you only go this far. Okay, that's the method. To find the approximate variance of v, you only go this far. You say the approximate variance of v, well, this is a constant, so that doesn't count. It's just this number squared times the variance of t. Like 2 factorial. What? I am totally lost. This is from the second order Taylor expansion. Yeah, I know, but. The 2 factorial. So we. Uh -huh. This 2 factorial is from the second order Taylor expansion. This is a 1 over 1 factorial. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I know that, but. So if I want to find the approximate variance of v, that simply is sigma sub d squared, which is the point 0.1 squared, times g prime of mu, which was the uh, pi over, which was the pi over 2 mu squared, and then squared. Okay? So the, the standard deviation of v is approximately, therefore, 0.1 times just the pi over 2 mu squared. And this should be in millimeters cubed, because that's the units of V. V is in millimeters cubed, so they get millimeters here and square millimeters here. So this is giving 0.1 millimeters times pi over 2 times 2 millimeters squared equals uh, 4, which is what? Uh, point, point 0.1 uh, pi, 2 pi times 0.1 millimeter cubed. 0.6828 cubic millimeter. All right, that's the approximate standard deviation. Okay, what's we'll the approximate mean? Approximate mean is yeah, simply just plug in mu equals two to the formula. But then I ask for the correction. That's the part B. All right, so part B is the mean of V is approximately pi over six mu cubed plus. What do I get from the mean of this term? I get a 1 over 2 factorial of mu pi times the sigma squared sub d. That's what I get. Just take expectation of this whole expression. Okay. So I simply get uh, 8, 6 pi. That's cubic millimeters. Everything's in cubic millimeters. Okay. It's mu is 2. And then what are we getting here? Plus 1 half times 2 times pi times the variance is 0.01 square millimeters. And it was a 2 millimeters here. So I'm still getting 
cubic millimeters. Okay? And this, this is just a 0.01 pi. So I'm getting 8.6 plus 0.0 pi plus 0.01 pi. So this is like 1.333 pi plus 0.01 pi. Okay? So I get one point. So it's not even a 1% correction. What happened to the second term when you? It's only a 0.7% correction. What happened to the second term when you estimated the volume? I mean, the expected value of the volume. What? Oh. I'm sorry, what, what were you saying again? What happened in the second term? This one, when I take the... the I did use the second term. Now this term, when I take the expected value of volume? Yeah. It's That's zero. True. E of D minus mu is zero. Because E of D is mu. And then E of mu is mu. E of D minus mu squared is variance. E of D minus mu is zero. Okay. That's redoing the business. Okay, we're almost out of time. What's the last problem? It's standard central limit problem. Problem is not time. Let me go quickly through it so that you'll have the answer. You can look it at yourself. I had a bunch of other stuff I wanted to show you here. And I had my program running, my MATLAB program running in my office to actually get the exact probability okay. or simulated probability for this problem. Yeah. So you've got uh, x1 up to x20 independent, each with the same density, f of x equals 2x, 0 less than x less than 1. Okay. You have S is defined to be the sum. Okay? And find the probability of S is less than. Use the central limit theorem to find the probability that S is less than or equal to 10. S is a continuous random variable. So S less than or equal to 10 or S less than 10, it wouldn't make any difference. Alright, so what, how would I do this? What is the method? You simply normalize S to mean zero in unit variance in under the probability statement. Mean zero and unit variance by a linear transformation. And the linear transformation, since the variance is not negative, does not change the inequality. So you get this is equal to probability S minus something divided by something less than or equal to 10 minus something divided by something. Okay. Yeah. With so something that's positive. Isn't that mu and sigma? Mu and sigma, yeah. Mu of s, s, mu sub s, and sigma sub s. Okay? Yeah. All right? Well, that's trivial then, right? Oh. Okay. Well, all we have to do is just calculate sigma, or mu s and sigma. Yeah. Well, but you so this now is approximately, this is your normalized variable, I call it capital Z now. And that's approximately standard normal. Mm -hmm. okay. So and this is what I call little z. And so really all that matters is to calculate little z. And then look to the tables. So like mu of s, isn't that the mean of s? So I have to find what I have to find find the mean of s. Mean of f of s. Mean of variance of s is the sum of things. I can use the independence to find the variance as a, as a, sum, as a sum of variance. So it's just n times. So it's just n times. So 20 times e s equals 20 e, right? times e mm -hmm. x1. So the, the catch in this yeah. problem is I didn't tell you with e x1. It's only give you the density. So you have to calculate yeah. it, which is 2 thirds in this case. OK, it's easy to put x against 2x and you get x cubed over 3 and there's 2, so 2 thirds. OK? The variance of s, again, using the independence, is 20 times the variance of x1. Again, I have to calculate the variance of x1. This time it's 1 18th. OK? You have to do the calculation. You must do the calculation. Do them at home. Okay? They're easy. Alright? Yeah. So maybe I'll write it down to only five problems and make an extra credit problem. Okay? 
The thing is, this test seems pretty long. Yeah, well, that's what I just said. I'm going to kill one of the problems. And I might stop one of those covariance problems with very mechanical in. How does that sound? Camera? Okay. <laughs> Go to the end of the lecture. Okay. Okay. So then you get a z. Z equals three point, negative 3.16, I believe. So I get a probability is 1 minus phi of 3.16 equals 1 minus 0.9992 equals about 0 0.0008. So is that really a good approximation? Yeah. Well, you hope so. We'll find out from MATLAB. But um, n is not very large. Oh, yeah. And also, if I get something like, uh, you know, how good is the error term in the essential limit theorem? If I get 0.0000008, is that a good approximation? Well, percentage-wise, probably not. Not when n is small, anyway. Because uh, the error in the essential limit theorem is going to be too big. Right? Oh, this is too complicated. So, anyway, we'll be curious to see what the actual probability is. It's not that easy to calculate.